When I was a kid, I remember my dad saying that he liked to watch airplanes take off at the airport because, as he put it, it, it just seemed so improbable. And you may know that there are people who like to sit next to runways and watch airplanes take off and land. To be fair, this pastime, it's pretty niche. But if you look at the videos that these folks take, you can see some amazing stuff. There's a whole subgenre of these videos. You can search for them. They're called crosswind landings. And if you look carefully, the planes often look like they're doing something kind of surprising, like they're, they're pointing in one direction, but they're moving in a different direction sometimes like almost seeming to move sideways i don't i don't know about you but i i don't think that's what airplanes are supposed to do or maybe a better way to say it is they only do that when they're being flown by really skilled pilots honestly the first time i saw one of these videos i just i found it really hard to believe and i messaged my buddy ray who's a retired airline pilot and before that he was in the air force i was like ray ray this is crazy what's going on here and i i really shouldn't have been surprised by his response because Unlike enthusiastic science teachers, fighter pilots are exquisitely even-tempered and genetically programmed not to be excitable or startle. Anyway, Ray's response was something along the lines of, yep, that's how it's done, and he did not elaborate. This is related to another phenomenon. If you've ever been on a train and, and looked out the window, you see what's outside and and it moves by and that's not surprising but you can tell by looking out the window which way the train is going right in this in this picture you can see the landscape going by in one direction so clearly the train is moving to the left but this becomes a little more complicated sometimes you can look out the window and there's another train going by. And in this situation, when you see another train out the window, there are a couple of possibilities. It could be that that train is sitting still and you are moving to the left. On the other hand, you could be sitting still and the other train is moving to the right. It could also be that you're going to the right, but it's going to the right faster. You just can't tell when all you can see is the other train. Both of these situations, the weirdly moving airplane going sideways and the situation where you're looking at a train window and it's not really clear who's doing the moving and in which direction. These are both examples of what we call relative motion. So a quick note, if you are watching this video because you're taking a physics class, uh, two things. One, if you're watching this on your phone, just, just stop, stop the phone, Watch it on a bigger device because there's going to be math and notation and stuff and you want to see the details. The other thing is, if you were watching this for a physics class, now is a good time to press pause and go get something to take notes with and take notes on. Because there's going to be some math and there's going to be some details and there's going to be some notation that you need to know later. So this is, you know, um, you know, this is school. So press pause, go get something, then restart the video. No, I'm really serious. I wasn't joking around. Actually press pause and go get something to write down stuff with. The following video acknowledges the existence of differential calculus. Use discretion if viewing around small children or persons who may be sensitive to differentiation or calculus of any kind. No actual calculus will be depicted. And we're back. Any time that we specify where something is or how fast it's going, there's either an explicit or an implicit aspect to that statement. We're saying, where is that thing compared to something or with respect to something? Much of the time, we don't worry about this aspect because it's clear from context that we're comparing this location to the origin. But sometimes it really matters. Sometimes the comparison itself is a big part of what's going on. Now we're going to start this discussion with really, really simple situations. Situations that are so simple, you can figure out what's going on in your head just by looking at them, or as we say, by inspection. But while we're doing the simple stuff, we're going to introduce some notation. And the notation is overkill for the simple situations. But it's important to understand the notation because there are other situations where what's going on is not so obvious. And it's not clear how to do the math. 
And it's the notation itself that's gonna save you. It's the notation that's gonna make it clear how to do the math in more complicated situations. So we're just gonna go right ahead, use fancier math than is really necessary here, but it's gonna help us later. So here we have a point P, and the position of that point P is gonna be measured by this person A, and they're gonna report out that measurement as X sub P A, meaning the position of point P compared to A. Where is P relative to A? Now, person A at the same time has a position themselves, and that position might be compared to the origin. So we'll plop down a person on the origin. That person can measure where is person A compared to the origin, and we'll report out that value as XAO, meaning the position of A compared to the origin. So now we have to ask, let's, let's suppose that the person at the origin actually can't see point P for some reason. We're like, so given what we know, how do we find out where is point P compared to the origin? Now this diagram and the associated math, they're not really complicated. We can see that if P is to the left of A, so it would have some negative position value, and A is to the right of the origin, it's going to have some positive position value, that we can find out the position of P with respect to the origin by just adding up the other two positions. Simply put, the X position of point P compared to the origin is the sum of the X position of P compared to A and the X position of A compared to the origin. Later, you are going to look at problems that are going to feel a lot more confusing than this. But if you can just write down this little diagram and then write down the associated math just like this, you will be able to do much more complicated problems. But let's do a quick simple example. Suppose here we've got some point P compared to point A, and we'll look at that position of point P compared to point A, and there's a number, you can remember it or write it down, but there's where P is compared to A. And so where is A compared to the origin? And you can look at that number and you can remember it or you can write it down. And now we're gonna have to ask, where is point P compared to the origin? You can probably do this in your head, but let's just look at the formalism. We know that the position of P compared to O is the sum of P with respect to A and the position of A with respect to the origin. You may recall that the position of A with respect to the origin was about 5 meters and the position of P with respect to A was about 7 meters. So we ought to be able to conclude that the position of P with respect to the origin is the sum of these two things. But how do we get from this to what the airplanes were doing or what the trains were doing. Okay, this is a moment I mentioned before there was gonna be some calculus. If you don't know any calculus yet, don't, don't worry about it. This is not an operation you need to be able to perform. But if you do know calculus, now you can see the connection between the very obvious fact of how the positions sum to how the velocities sum. If we take this equation and we differentiate both sides of the equation. On the left, we're going to have the derivative of the position of P with respect to the origin. And on the right, we're going to have the derivative of the sum of those other two positions. Well, it may or may not be obvious to you, but if we take those two derivatives, what you end up with is the velocities. And the velocities add up in exactly the same way that the positions add up just through the miracle of differentiation. So the velocity of point P with respect to the origin is equal to the sum of the velocity of point P with respect to A and the velocity of point A with respect to the origin. Looks pretty formal, but we're actually familiar with this kind of stuff in real life, like when you're in traffic. So here's an example. Let's say you've got an origin and you've got A coming by compared to the origin, say at five meters per second. And at the same time, there's some other point moving with respect to the origin. Here comes P and it's moving to the left at 
10 meters per second. What does the person inside car A see? Well, compared to A, A thinks A is standing still, right? It's why, you know, you can sit in the car and reach for something that's next to you and pick it up because it's not moving compared to you. What do you see about the oncoming car? Well, it looks like they're going faster than they would otherwise. In this case, P would look like it's coming past. Well, let's see, how do we do the math here? We've got to t add something to five to get negative 10. And in this case, it's negative 15. It looks like the oncoming traffic is coming at A faster than that car looks like it's moving compared to the origin. You can try an example for yourself. Here's a problem. Uh, take a moment, pause the video, grab yourself a pencil or don't, and see if you can answer this. Okay, I'm going to assume you've already paused and thought about it. What'd you get? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's check this. Okay. Mm, here's the equation we should be using. And I've got bike compared to origin and bike compared to train and train compared to origin here, right? Not A's and so on. But here we know the bike compared to the train is negative 15. We know the bike compared to the origin is positive 23. So the train compared to the origin, oh, it's 38. But how do we get from this one-dimensional kind of situation to stuff that has to do with airplanes moving sideways and boats and so on? Well, let's go back to our really simple one-dimensional diagram and one-dimensional equation. It turns out that instead of just leaving it in one dimension, we could stretch this into two dimensions, where the vectors here show where point A is compared to the origin, where point P is compared to point A, and where point P is compared to the origin. And you should be able to convince yourself that the vector math here works out because the two vectors on the right have been placed tip to tail, and so when they sum up, tell you where P is with respect to the origin. This diagram right here, kind of like that first one that I said it's worth remembering and being able to recreate this. This falls into that same category. You want to be able to draw this kind of out of your head so that you can write this equation down. Again, sometimes things are going to look really straightforward, but sometimes it's going to be confusing. And if you have the formalism right, you can just plug in values. Because we can do the same calculus trick we did before, where we differentiate both sides of this equation and suddenly turn all of those position vectors into velocity vectors. And now we have velocities compared to other things. And this is what's going to take us to planes and boats. So let's suppose we have a plane and it's flying along above the clouds. It can't see the ground. So inside the plane, they only know how they're moving compared to the air. The plane's going to move along here. We've got the velocity of the plane with respect to the air. This is known as the airspeed, and I'm sorry that it's confusing. It's just what people say. The airspeed is not the speed of the air. It's the speed of the plane compared to the air. But at the same time that the plane is doing this, the air is moving compared to the ground. This is literally like the coordinate system of the air is moving in another direction. We call this the velocity of the air with respect to the ground, that is known as wind. If these two things happen at the same time, if the air moves compared to the ground and the plane moves compared to the air, we get this kind of odd motion where the plane is moving over the ground in a direction that the plane is not pointing. Right? If you're look, sitting on the ground looking at the plane, the plane looks like it's moving kind of sideways. And as weird as that may look, the vector math comes out very neatly. We have the airspeed, the velocity of the plane compared to the air, and we have the wind, the velocity of the air with respect to the ground. And those two things add up as vectors to give us the ground speed, the velocity of plane with respect 
to the ground. And what can we do with this? Well, we can solve some problems. This vector equation that relates the ground speed, the air speed, and the wind will help us solve all kinds of tricky navigation problems. Let's take an example. Suppose we've got a pilot. They're headed northeast with an airspeed of 150 knots. On the other hand, her GPS tells her that her ground speed is 142 knots, 38 degrees north of east. Question, how fast is the wind blowing? What we need to do is translate this problem into some vectors that we can solve. So let's draw the vectors. Here's her airspeed. We know she's heading northeast at 150 knots. Here is her ground speed. We know that her ground speed is 162 knots, 28 degrees north of east. In order for us to figure out exactly what to do with these vectors, it really helps to go back to the equation and try to identify what is what here. So first, let's look at the airspeed. What is the airspeed? That's the velocity of the plane compared to the air. I'm just going to label that. And what's the ground speed? That's the velocity of the plane compared to the ground. I'm going to label that. And now, now we can really took this, turn this into like an intelligible vector problem, right? The velocity of the air with respect to the ground, that's the wind. That's the thing that we're looking for. And so now we can, we can make a drawing that will help us figure out the wind. Because if we look at the right-hand side of that equation, essentially what it's saying is, what do we add to VPA? What mysterious wind vector can we add to VPA in order to get VPG? Right? That's the algebraic concept here. Here's how it would be drawn. We're going to take VPA and VPG and go, what can we add to VPA to get VPG? That red vector there, that's going to be our wind. Well, this is now a problem for some triangle trigonometry because we have a bunch of information that we can put into that vector diagram. We know their directions, we know their magnitudes, so now we can find the angle in between them. And now we just, we've got a triangle and we got a side and an angle and a side. And this looks probably like a job for the law of cosines. Well, now this is just a job for your calculator. You're gonna just do some math here. And the next thing you know, we're gonna take a square root and look, the wind was blowing at 50 knots. And all that came out of this vector triangle. Now you may be wondering whether or not you can recreate this kind of problem, especially if it doesn't look exactly like this. And what I want to remind you is that we started with a super simple principle, simple enough that you should be able to recreate those equations. So let's go back to where we started. We had a point P measured by a person A, and person A was being located compared to the origin. We were like, where is point P compared to the origin? That isn't too hard. It's the sum of the other two position values. And then we took this and we said, well, we could also do this in two dimensions, not just one dimension. So we take this and we stretch it into two dimensions and we make the equation a vector equation. Okay, so far, so good. This is just vector addition. Then the next thing you do is you say, oh, you know what? Velocities work just like position vectors, whether you do the calculus or not. So we can turn all these positions into velocities. And now we can just take the sum of those two relative velocities to find the velocity of point P compared to the origin. This is just a principle, right? This is very abstract. What is A and P and O? But as soon as you're looking at a problem, you're turning A and P and O into actual things. In our case, the ground was the origin. What's the point P we're measuring? That's the plane. And then the plane can be compared to some other reference frame. In this case, it was the air. And then it's just a question of going, what are those different relationships? The velocity of the air compared to the ground is the wind. The velocity of the plane 
compared to the air is the air speed and the velocity of the plane compared to the ground is the ground speed. Once you can get to this vector equation, you can solve these problems. But it's going to take a little bit of practice. So uh, go practice. Go solve some problems.